Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for joining us to here today for the very first of a very hectic and busy schedule of press conferences and issue briefings at the 25th World Economic Forum on Africa. This is a very significant one because it provides a narrative journey from our annual meeting in the snowy slopes of Davos in Switzerland here to Cape Town, South Africa. A challenge was launched, the UBS Davos Challenge, which saw participants at our annual meeting collectively walk a sufficient number of miles to, to, to trigger uh, a, a project by UBS to donate bicycles to school children here in South Africa. We're, of course, talking about the beautiful Buffalo bike, which you see right in front of you. The purpose of this issue, issue briefing is to download some of, the, uh, some of the facts about the journey since then to get an idea of, of where the project is going and, and what the implementation is going to be like on the ground. First, before that, I'd just like to hand over to my colleague, Elsie Kanza, who is the head of Africa at the World Economic Forum, just to provide a few words about how, why she sees this project as significant. Thank you, Ollie. So education is a, one of our 10 global challenges, and this is just underscoring the importance at a global level, but also at a regional level. Um, one of the areas in which, the, in which Africa lags behind, um, as highlighted in the forum's Global Competitiveness Report, is education. And it's education at all levels um, that ultimately impacts how effective uh, companies can be, how effective governments can be, um, and therefore uh, this is an area in which the forum is, is very much uh, passionate about convening our various partners in order to make inroads. This year in particular, as we mark 25 years of the forum's engagement with Africa and uh, partnering the transformation of uh, the continent, with South Africa being the initial focus, um, and ultimately uh, ending up with a continental focus, um, this is also part of the, of the progression. Um, as we move from establishing the forum to building communities to moving from ideas to, to action, so this particular um, initiative by UBS uh, came at a welcome time um, with this uh, focal focus on boosting human capital as well as addressing uh, youth uh, unemployment. It was particularly uh, welcome to us because it's about engaging the, the Davos community, the global community, in issues that are locally relevant, but being able to draw upon uh, global expertise, and you'll hear more about that, not just in terms of interventions, but also in measuring the impact that interventions can have. Um, and we look forward to seeing how these bicycles will impact the lives of school children in rural South Africa um, and ultimately across the continent and the world. Thank you. Thank you, Ossie. Uh, now I'd like to ask Caroline Anstey, the Global Head of UBS and Society, to talk us a little bit through the journey from the conception and maybe what you've learned since then and what the next steps are following this meeting. Well, thank you very much, Ollie, and thank you to Elsie. It's a great delight for us to be here. I think, as Ollie mentioned, um, this is really uh, grown out of the Davos Challenge. What was the Davos Challenge? It was a challenge to the participants in Davos to walk um, uh, six kilometers. Uh, for every six kilometers each participant walked, we would donate a bicycle. Uh, and we donated 2,500 bicycles, and I'm pleased to say that 600 of them are being delivered uh, later this month here in South Africa to Limpopo province. Uh, why six kilometers? Because six kilometers is the average distance that a South African school child um, in that region will walk to work. And why bicycles? For exactly the reason that um, Elsie said, because we, uh, we see already that the further a child has to walk, the more it can impact its uh, enrollment in school and the more it can impact attainment. But I think what is really critical about uh, this program is uh, not just the donation of bicycles, but I think it's the commitment to try and find out exactly what the impact is. Elsie talked a little bit about the history of the WEF and the forum. I think if you went back 10 years to a discussion almost anywhere in the world about development, all the discussion would be about the volume of money, how much money is being given. There was very little focus on impact, results, value for money. And I think the world has changed. 
Taxpayers want to make sure that if it's public money, it's used well. Private donors want to make sure they have smart philanthropy and the money is used well. And the private sector also wants to make sure that uh, the same kind of results measurement can be used in development, in education and health that are used uh, in the private sector. So what does that mean? I think it means that in the case of this project and some other very interesting work going on in South Africa, there's a real focus on the results base. And we're very pleased that uh, we've launched now a study, SRI, out of Stanford, the US, are doing basically an impact study uh, of the effect of the bicycles. What does that mean? That means they're going to track for two years a group of the students who receive the bicycles. They will look at what is the impact on enrollment, what is the impact on their performance in national exams, uh, what is the impact on gender imbalances? We know there is a gender imbalance. More boys are going to school uh, than girls. And what, does the, what do those results tell us for how we can scale this program up? Well, Bicycle Relief is doing 6,000 bicycles in South Africa, and there's potential to take this program in many more African countries. I think this, uh, this survey by SRI is the first one that's ever been done in Africa. So I think the results will be very key for seeing if this really is a powerful intervention and testing the results of the Davos Challenge. We know that a similar uh, study was undertaken in India where by giving bicycles to girls, it had an enormous impact on reducing the gender gap. So I think um, it's, a very important, um, it's a very important initiative. I think it's very significant that South Africa is doing it. And there are other, uh, there are other places uh, in the nation, in some of the provinces, where results-based financing is being done. And we will make the, uh, we will make the results transparent. Uh, why is UBS? Uh, partnering the, on this. I think uh, UBS has perhaps the only uh, foundation attached to a bank in the world that is committed to using clients' money for development purposes in a way that is impactful, has results, can be measured, and have leverage. And this program fits in very squarely into that. And uh, as I say, I think the, uh, the proof will be in the pudding and so far, the pudding is rising well, uh, but we have, to, we have to check on it uh, every six months or so to make sure the results really are on track and, where necessary, make mid-course corrections. Thank you very much. Thank you. F.K. Day, you're the co-founder and executive vice president of World Bicycle Relief. Perhaps give us some background to see your uh, philosophy here and also your involvement in this project and how you see any lessons learned from implementing on the ground? Great, thank you very much, Oliver. And uh, first, thank you, and Elsie and Caroline. It's, uh, it's wonderful to be here. Um, I think to start with, if we panelists went around the room and asked everybody what their transportation story was today or this week, we'd probably hear stories about being stuck in traffic, having delayed airplanes, getting in a train, driving your car. But if you ask the same question in uh, many parts of rural Africa, what you find is are, their transportation story would be about walking. And oftentimes it would be about walking from sunup to sundown, trying to get a little bit ahead, walking to get to school, walking to the clinics, walking to the fields to work, and then walking to the markets to try to sell. So we don't have a transportation amongst us in this room, but there are many, many people that do. We don't think about it because we have so many choices, and that's really where World Bicycle Relief comes in. We founded World Bicycle Relief 10 years ago, immediately following the Indian Ocean tsunami. We thought to ourselves, well, maybe we could raise money and send it to the Red Cross, or maybe we could do something more impactful, leveraging our experience in the bicycle industry and deliver large-scale programs to individuals who had lost so much. We measured the program in Sri Lanka. It was about 23,000 bikes, 24,000 bikes. And we find that, found that there was deep and immediate impact in the areas of education, healthcare, and economic development. After the end of that program, we thought, OK, great. We'll go back to uh, working on bikes for the US and Europe. 
But someone came to me and said, do you know what World Bicycle Relief? The work you've done here is important, but do you realize that the same number of people that died in the tsunami die every two weeks in rural Africa, silently and preventably? They said, you've got to scale this up in Africa. So our first program in Africa was in Zambia, where we did a 23,000 bike program in support of connecting healthcare workers out into, uh, deep into the communities. And then we moved into microfinance, and then we moved into education. Education is what I'm going to focus in on for a second. We found that connecting students to distant rural schools had a direct and immediate impact on attendance and performance. Our internal studies suggested that over 20% greater attendance was occurred after someone received a bike in the rural areas and over a 50% increase in the performance occurred. To date, we've done about 60,000 bikes in multiple countries throughout uh, southern and eastern Africa, and the results are very similar. We have never measured the program to the extent that UBS is measuring it today. All of our work is qualitative or quantitative, no, <laughs> anecdotal, mostly anecdotal, and there's still a lot of numbers, but we've never done it with the rigor that UBS is bringing to this. We've done a lot of measuring and evaluation because it's important for us to improve our programs, but the rigor with which UBS is leading this study is going to have a dramatic effect, definitely on our programs, but hopefully on the educational outcomes of rural students all over Africa and many other developing countries around the world. Our focus is primarily on the girl students. Where we have a passion for that. And the results there extend the length of your arm in terms of safety, attendance, time saved. It's pretty remarkable. We're very excited to be part of the study. Uh, we thank you for your forward-looking uh, way of addressing development and uh, looking forward to the next two years working with you. Thank you. Let's see if there are any questions. OK. Early nerves. Adrienne, Fab, can you please give us your name? There's a microphone coming and let us know where you're from. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Adrienne Klasa. I'm with This Is Africa, the Financial Times. Um, I was just curious, first of all, how much are, uh, I'm assuming that this spike model that you have in front of us is of the type that will be given to the communities in Limpopo. Um, and I was wondering, how much are each individual bike worth, roughly? Um, it depends how you uh, how you cost it so to speak sure. we uh, we try to apply all of the um, our expenses to get the bike here the expenses for training mechanics we, we've trained over a thousand mechanics to help maintain the bikes get them out in the fields but I would say a, a rough guess would be in the 150 to 175 range depending on how you looked at it um, if you piled everything in it would probably be more like in the $200 range um, but if you looked at it just as cost of goods coming out of uh, our manufacturing countries, it, it would be a lot less. Great. And then as a follow to that, I was just wondering if there were any concerns. Um, I mean, 150 to $200 American is quite valuable in those contexts. Um, it, are there any concerns that the bicycles might not be used for the purposes intended, but might be either sold for pirates or... Um, used by family members for other purposes than getting kids to school? And is this something that's been observed in other programs? Uh, well, I think a, a really important part of, um, of the programming is that uh, we manage the supply chain. We provide a template that uh, we have found has worked um, in, different, in different areas. And we work with implementing partners on the ground that are really community-based uh, organizations that have deep relationships with the communities. They put together a bicycle supervisory committee that includes um, the headmasters of the schools, the headmen or women of the communities, uh, teachers, uh, parents, and students. And their directive is to select the students who should receive the bike. We don't know that. They do. The primary, uh, it's primarily based on distance. And then also to assist in monitoring the usage of the bike. And if the bike is, if the child stops coming to school and the bike is being used to, to run to the pub, then that's not, that's not the intention. The community will take that bike back and reallocate it. So we've really pushed that monitoring uh, deep into the community. So we've seen great results for that. I would, I would add one, one point about the family's use of the bike. The program does allow for the family to use the bike when the bike is not being used for school, as long as it's, they're not using it as an either-or. Uh, but 
one of the things that the monitoring is going to do is look at when the family uses the bike, do you have um, knock-on benefits around access to healthcare clinics? Uh, and what does it do, particularly for the women in the family, in terms of their mobility? And, and early signs are that, yes, it, it can be used in a very positive way to help with access to health and other, other public goods. Any other questions? Gentleman in the third row. Hi, my name is Alton Plakis uh, from Ventures Africa. Uh, how much weight have executives put on since Davos after the six kilometers? <laughs> my real question um, pertains more to how do, do you have any plans to cascade this to other schools perhaps, where kids are in good schools, where they could take part in some kind of activity that could assist? And then South Africa, as an example, has the biggest cycling event in the world, the Cape Town Argus cycle tour. Um, you could cascade that into, in a country like this where so many people are active, are there any plans to cascade that into a kind of event where people would pay and that kind of funding be used for these bicycles? Well, I, I think it was very successful at Davos, and in fact, the average the average distance walked was about more like 13 kilometers. And uh, the way it was set up was that everybody had a Fitbit which would measure their distance of walk and also has, has very good uh, health, health uh, uh, implications and health results. Um, I think it can be rolled out to lots of different venues and it, and it probably should be. From the UBS point of view, what we're really interested in doing is now using this study to see what the impact is, how we can target it, how it could be scaled up. Because I think, um, I think as I said before, the, the real key around development now is to know what is the result of intervention A as opposed to intervention B, and then direct your, either your public resources or your private resources in that direction. So I think from our point of view, we really want to see the results of this study. And since this is the first study of its kind, uh, in Africa, I think it will be enormously valuable uh, to other organizations and other countries. Gentlemen in the front row. Thank you. Johan Barnard from Maiden Guardian Africa. What are those metrics of success? Um, we don't have the greatest uh, track record in education, um, never mind giving the, the kids textbooks. So how do you measure that and how would you then roll that out to other African countries? I think um, obviously bicycles is not a, a silver bullet. It's going to help um, on attendance, we think. It will help on gender parity. And, and we believe, as, as it's shown in other countries, it will help on attainment. But we have to test that. But it isn't a substitute for uh, an issue of are our children getting the textbooks? Are our children getting the proper nutrition they need to learn? Uh, so, I mean, we, I think we have to be conscious of other interventions, and we also have to look at, you know, what is the overall quality of education in some of these schools? We know that in rural schools, often uh, don't have the, the same degree of investment around education, don't have the same quality of teachers, don't get the same... Uh, uh, attention from local provinces. I think what is interesting about this is the study is going to be in three provinces, Limpopo, uh, KwaZulu-Natal, and Eastern Cape. And you'll be able to see a little bit some comparisons across them as well. But um, education, we know, is the best investment that you can probably make in your society's future. Um, learning uh, attendance are really key. Uh, bicycles will help in some areas. They may not help in all areas, but we also need to focus on the other interventions. And again, for that, the more we know about what, uh, what are the levers uh, that you pull to get a result here or a different result there, the better. Do we have any more questions? There's one from me, actually, Caroline, if you don't mind. 
if you'll indulge me for a second. One of the impact investors I met this morning was um, on the news, in fact, just before Elsie was, uh, was going live, was, was lobbying for 20% of all CSR funding to be channeled towards education. Do you agree that that, that kind of ballpark figure is, is, is right? I think, I think it depends on different contexts. Um, sometimes, I would argue, uh, the development world has been too siloed of different interventions. There's no question that um, education is important, but so is health. Uh, one of the keys is how do we put these things together? You know, if you can use your schools for also delivering your health care, you're already bringing two areas together. So I think um, education is important, but it's more important in certain continents than others. If you look at um, East Asia, for example, they have very good education numbers, but then they've made the investment. So um, I think in Africa, education would be a very high priority for your social investment, yes. Any more questions? Okay, well, thank you very much. Thank you all on my panel, and thank you for joining us here in the room. And also thank you to our audience watching us on our webcast.